All righty, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to another installment of What's Your Voyage, the podcast where we have extraordinary people on. We have a conversation about the journey or the voyage of their lives. This evening, we have co-host William Twiss in the building. How are we, my friend? Feeling good, man, and excited for this one. And we got Owen Haig. How's it going? His blood. Oh my blood. His blood. He's on the video cameras. And then we have none other than a woman that has done extraordinary things for her community, both on a very local level, but also on a larger state and federal level. We have Jane Lomax Smith. Good evening. Good evening. How's your day been? It's been fabulous. It's been better since I left the gym. <laughs> 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 no, that's good. So, first time back in the gym in a while. Mm-hmm. What'd you focus on? I was doing my legs. Doing the yeah. leg gains. Fair enough. Yeah. That's fair enough. And reluctantly, I actually really dislike going to the gym, but I think it's good for me. It is. Will, he he loves forcing people into the gym. <laughs> <laughs> for years, he's yeah. been like, Hamish, you have to come to the gym. Or she's going to die. And eating food as well. That's an important one. I yeah. love eating food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's really important to be fit, particularly if you're busy. You need to have the stamina. And it doesn't really matter what you do. you just got to keep moving. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. Facts. So I think we should just point out the obvious right now, that we have a big poster of you with Greek writing on it and then another one with Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese and what was the other one? Italian and Greek. Italian and Greek. Why do we have those? Well, I've, I'm a bit obsessed with numbers and statistics and I've been really fascinated by looking at the census and probably not many people get obsessed with that kind of metric, but it's amazing. The, the city has changed so much over the last 25 years. For instance, 57% of people live in apartments. Who would have thought that? In the whole of like just the CBD or in terms of Adelaide? Adelaide council area, 57%. Yeah. Now, you and I live in cottages, but yes. everybody else seems to live in flats. And that's actually had a really profound impact on the city because it means that those people have different problems from the problems we have. They struggle with on-street parking. None of them, not all of them have off-street parking. They struggle to find EV charging points. They complain bitterly about their rubbish collection because their rubbish isn't collected by the council the way yours and mine is. So they complain constantly that they have to pay for a rubbish collection service on top of their rates. So there are a whole range of things that are different for flats, but also the residents are different because 40% of people speak a language other than English at home. Again, that's a pretty large percentage and larger than I expected. And so you can go through the stats and see how many speak Mandarin, how many speak Cantonese, how many Greek, how many Italian. And it makes you think that if you're standing for election, don't you want all those people to understand what you're saying? So we went to some length lengths to have my website have click boxes to go to different languages and so that the same story, the same history, the same account, the same commitments were given to each in each language. And this was done in a quite sophisticated way because you can go Google Translate and it can come out like gobbledygook. I yeah, mean, you does. know what Google it Translate does. does. So we actually managed to get a proper translation and make sure that people could really understand. That's very considerate. Well, it's considerate, but it's fun as well. I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it properly. Yeah. I'm actually shocked that half the city, well, over half the city now, is living in apartments. And why is it that the waste collection services is done private for them? Is it because the trucks just don't have the actual facilities to pick up those type of larger bins? I think that's one thing, but also the system is geared for normal rubbish bins, like your wheelie bins, Mm. and you... If you've got a block of flats with you know 500 people in it, you can't have 500 wheelie bins on the street, so they have to no. have the bigger bins. Oh, of course. And the council has done various deals in terms of approval. So sometimes if they think it's low-cost housing, they say, oh, you know, you're not going to be able to afford a car, you'll be too poor, you won't have a car, so there's no off-street parking or no on-street parking. And they're banned forever from the system of on-street parking. And the other thing they've done is stop those people in flats getting access to the rubbish collection. So that there are inequities because those people are disadvantaged. Mm. And that's something I hadn't appreciated until the last few months. 
And the other issue that you and I would know from living in cottages is that we get really cross if someone builds something big that takes away our light <laughs> yeah. or, you know, it spoils the view. But actually that's the same in blocks of flats. Um, people have bought a flat with a fabulous view and quick as a flash someone's built something 14 stories next to it, four metres away. So the issues are both similar and special, but it's, it's interesting to look at those issues and think... Maybe the council hasn't moved with the times. Maybe they haven't thought what changes when you have such a big percentage of people living in flats. Well, given your worldly background, how do you see to tackle those kind of things? Well, I've lived in flats in London, in Boston. I've lived in apartment blocks and I have seen a more sophisticated manner of dealing with planning laws um, you need to have really strict rules to make sure that there's no f- leakage of noise, plumbing noises going from floor to floor, and you have to have protections. And I, so I think the planning laws, which are going to be reviewed, and there's a consultation now, I only hope the council's got some view on what needs to change, but they need to tighten the rules to make it compulsory for the developers to make sure that the things that are required are in the building, and that might be EV charging points, but also to change the regulations around what council does because they have to move with the times. You can't have 57% of the population feeling angry. I mean, if we want people to come to the city, we have to make it nice to live here. We can't have people cross. And it's like customer service and the council has to service the residents. That's fair enough. Will? Jan, do you think there's been an agenda to take away street parking in the city council area over the last couple of years? I think that the way that the bicycle paths have been put in and the way the traffic... Jane, calming, I'll just get you to make sure that the mic... Because they're pretty directional. So sorry. if you just keep it in front, you can move it around a bit. And kind Sorry of, about that. That's all good. I just wanted to look at Will while I was talking to him. <laughs> um, I think that the way that some of the traffic calming has been put in and the bicycle paths have been put in has been very difficult for traffic flow. Um, and... I'm not convinced that it's been the most sophisticated installation. I mean, I I drive through the city very rarely because I don't use a car very much. I don't, you know, I use use them so rarely. But it's really difficult to turn left sometimes um, and it's really difficult to move around the city. When you live in the city, it's actually even more annoying than living outside the city because you're in the wrong place and there are no left turns, no right turns. I think that they need more work on making it easier to get through, not just being obstructive. Yeah, well, I was having a chat with one of the other councillors today and what they said was why they wanted to make it harder to move north to south for their traffic studies was that they wanted to deter people from that north and south coming in because that's most of our traffic flow and and actually incentivise them to use the ring route, which... I'd get if we were, you know, the size of London, but, like, I feel like we actually kind of need that traffic flow to come into our city. I think that car travel's really difficult because traders want cars to come into the city. um, Of course. And they need it to nurture their businesses. But clearly a pedestrianised city would be more attractive to live in. So there's going to be conflict. I think there's also conflict between pedestrians and scooters and bikes on the footpath. And I might be the only person in the world, but I really get antsy when some bicycle nearly knocks me off the pavement. I think that it will be better to have bicycle paths on the road than bikes and scooters zooming along the pedestrian footpaths. I think it's really dangerous. Yeah. Well, most of... We have a fair bit of bike lanes, but they're just not very, like, They protected. don't seem to be well designed or... They're not protected. No. Like, you feel sketchy because I don't think there's a very friendly they don't link. culture. They don't link well across the whole city. No, they don't. Do you ride a bike? Yeah, in summer more so than winter. But like biking has been like a thing that I've grown up doing. More downhill mountain bike riding, so like doing jumps over mountains and stuff like that. So have you been to Melrose? I actually have. It's great, isn't it? That's an amazing place for cross-country cycling. Sorry, that's a bit off off message. (laughs) Ah, It's okay. We don't need to just be on message (laughs) here. That's what it's all about. It's about raw, authentic chats. Yeah, it's about having a chit-chat. Melrose is so amazing, that bike track. Yeah, I thought it was great. I had a good time, actually. I think the one we did with Inside Line 
was actually on someone's private property, though, as opposed to... The public downhill. Yeah, it wasn't that. It was, like, on a private property. It's really scary, though. Yeah, it can be. I definitely remember, like, the whole of practice day at Eagle on the Hill. You know Eagle on the Hill? Yep. That track that they made there was probably, like, 12, and I'm standing there for the whole day about going down this, like, staircase that is just boulders. It's not, like, stairs. They're, like, boulders, but in a stair formation. And at one point, my mum goes, Hamish, get on your fucking bike and go down those stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, she's like, I would do it if I was you. She would, and I, I like, know her. I was like, do it then. And she's like, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but then the next morning, we had all these like really, really good riders. And two of those people that were standing there at the bottom being like, well, I'll catch you if you fall, actually went to become two of the top 10 riders in the whole world. Yeah. So shout outs to Adelaide. We we make good bike riders. <laughs> we manufacture them. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, back to you politicking and trying to make a difference to this city. Um, how do you see to solve the bike thing? Because I feel like that's a pretty hard thing, especially with all the street trees that we have. I think you need to have proper technical advice about making it better. And sometimes you can invent the wheel too many times independently. And we are not the only city in the world with bike lanes you go around holland you go around switzerland you go around germany and they do it so much better i just think we'd need to take advice and do it properly i'm not an engineer but it seems to me we haven't quite got it right yet yeah okay and has that been across like your political career how you've gone about making changes is going hey there's well, other th- places doing it let's get experts I think it's better to learn from other people's experience. And one of the challenges in Australia is they often pick up an issue after someone else. A lot of the things we do, we, for instance, um, closing down psychiatric hospitals and putting people into the community, um, they did that in England. And you would have thought that with if Australia had been smart, they might have recognised you needed more services in the community. You can't save money by doing that. You've got to spend as much money but make it different and put services to wrap around those people so they're protected. Similarly with outsourcing. Um, Every country around the world outsourced a lot of services and the issues have always been the same. If you don't manage the contracts and you don't have proper monitoring, then you get ripped off and you don't get the service. What kind of services are you talking about? Like waste or...? Well, whether it's road repairs or um, electricity services, a whole load of outsourcing contracts, whether they're for childcare or whatever, across the world have been outsourced. And if they don't have careful contract monitoring, you don't get as good a service as you would want. In There's comparison nothing... to like the public sector doing Yes, it? I'm not saying the public service is better always better but you won't get it better unless you manage the contracts and you actually keep people accountable Mm. and you charge and fine them for not delivering if you just let it go then it's bound to be worse so you have to learn from other people's mistakes so i think that's one of the issues about australia picking up policies after other people but the other the other issue is that you have to work out what's fair and try and deliver policies that improve things there's no point doing something just because it's different. Mm-hmm. It ha- you have to have a rationale for it. Um, and sometimes saving money is a good rationale, but otherwise it actually provides a worse service and you've got to be honest about that. Yeah. So what kind of things have you like, been a part of making solutions for in your career? Well, I think that the best things I've been involved with have, things, uh, have been things that have been across multiple bits of government and one of the the things I've noticed in government is that everyone talks about silos and it's very tempting to, to bang on about government being full of bureaucrats in silos but in reality if you have different departments they tend to look after their own problems mm. and one of the things you I noticed for instance um with early childhood development, let's say, where children get to school and their literacy is poor, or their, their language skills are poor, let's say, you can't just make that better by putting in more childcare. You actually have to put speech pathology. You need often physiotherapy. Mm. You need support for parents who are struggling. 
And often those services come from different departments. So one of the joys of being in a cabinet is you can sometimes find schemes to actually force other departments to do something to help someone else. And one of the technical issues is that the CEO of one department has KPIs that relate to their own problems. Making them work for another department is a big challenge across government because they're in silos. So I think that the successes I've had have been across government in those areas. Um, I've also been quite delighted to improve school retention and that's, again, not just with the school system. It often requires looking after um, children who are under the guardianship of the minister or children with learning difficulties and those services come from other departments. So for me the joy has been doing something technically straightforward but by making parts of government work together because otherwise everyone carries on in their own track. And how have you gone about dealing with different things that go wrong and like heads that, you know, like egos that clash and... I think one of the interesting things about government policy or any policy is that very often you're told this is a wonderful thing to do, you do this and something happens. And I always say, what could go wrong? Mm. You always have to say, what's the da- unintended consequences? Mm. And when you look at things that have really gone wrong in government, you know, the really big mess ups, you know, whether it's pink bats or whether it's the NDIS funding to, you know, slightly sleazy providers, whether <laughs> it's um, areas where people <laughs> rip off the system. If you put a policy in and you don't think who's going to rip it off and where it's going to go wrong, it will go belly up. Mm. It's always important to say what are the unintended consequences because if you can think about it beforehand, then you can stop disasters happening. And I think that COVID was interesting as well because not that I, you know, I had any real close involvement with how COVID was managed, but it was quite clear that there was a rush to deliver subsidies and support. There was a rush to buy PPE. And human nature is such that if there's a way of ripping off the system, someone will find it. Yep. And I think that when those systems were put in, they weren't smart enough to think, who could do something dodgy? You know, What kind of dodgy deal could be done? Who could rip us off? How could we claw it back? How could we say, you know, if we give you $5 million to pay your way out of COVID, how can we stop you giving that to your shareholders as a profit at the end? There should be the way of being smart. Are you talking about the vaccine here? Well, no, but I yeah. think it does seem yeah. to me that you should. Pre- it's our money that's being given away. Damn straight it is. Um, and in public life, I've always had three rules. Do I understand enough to make a decision? Do I know enough to explain it to my grandmother? And would I do it with my own money? And if you go through those steps, you can't get too much wrong. No, I mean, it's so sound, isn't it? That's, That's great. sound advice. <laughs> Everybody needs to listen to that for their yep. life. Cut that one up into like a reel. Their life, yeah. they need that. Yep. I need that. All right, cool. And what other things have you been a part of making change in? So, like, you know, retention at school, and was that in more like high school, like people high school completing school? staying until year 12. Yeah, okay. I halved the gap in Aboriginal retention. Wow. I, That's huge. That in, was huge. In South Australia, South national? Australia, or? South Australia. Yeah. Um, we. How'd you go about that? Like what kind of things happened that made the difference there? I took the responsibility for Aboriginal education away from the Aboriginal education officer and added it to the KPIs of every member of staff in the department. So the blowtorch was on all of them. It was mm. all their fault. It was all their responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you have no responsibility, you have no care. That's a common problem in the bureaucracy. Blowtorch has to be on everyone. Um, and you can't have a room of executives where they say, well, that's your problem. It has to be all their problem. It is, that, do you find that, because you've, obviously you've been really kind of almost everything in South Australian politics, you know, you've been a Lord Mayor, you've been a member for Adelaide, you've been a health minister, you've been a tourism minister. I've learnt to be cunning. Yeah. Do you, do you see... As someone who is a bit in the twilight of their career now, do you see 
the like that pic- twilight come on give us a break <laughs> do you see the bigger picture at times that maybe other politicians are, are missing oh i think everybody does the best they can but i've been particularly lucky because i've had a peculiar career and i'm unusual in public life because i've had a career beforehand in that I've been a doctor, I've been a pathologist, I've taught in universities, I've run businesses, I've run practices, I've run university departments, I've run hospital departments, I've run my own practice, and I've been in local government, and I've been in state government, so that I've actually picked up a few tricks along the way. And I think that it's really useful to think that you can change careers and you learn something all the way, each time you change. So... You, you pick up skills. I always think that being a doctor taught me how to judge people, tell if they work out if they're telling fibs. You, you learn about human nature as a doctor. Um, being a lecturer means you get used to public speaking. And you're never, you know, not phased by big audiences. Um, running businesses teaches you about cash flow and not, not misunderstanding the nature of your finances. You have to really be tight when you're running your own business. Mm. Um, When you're employing people, you have to learn how to employ them and how to remove them from your employment. Um, When you're in local government, you learn a lot about um, conflict of interest and probity and how legislation works. What's probity mean? To be honest and proper. Okay. Um, You... And then by the time you get into gov- I got into government, I got all those experiences. And I think also it teaches you how to be really careful. I mean, I, I think that you see people making a mess of their lives, losing their whole career be- because of stupidity, conflict of interest. I never had a government credit card. Um, I always spent my own money and then claimed back the cash if I needed to. Um, and always thinking... Is this the right thing to do? Is it honest? Is it decent? Would I be embarrassed by this? Would I be ashamed? Would this be wrong on the front page of the paper? You have to be really careful in public life to protect your own reputation, the reputation of your party or your government or whatever, and the council, if you're on council. You want to protect the council's reputation. You don't want to do anything that's improper. So I think that you get experience as you get older and you've been around. And... um, I think that probably you get better at things. I feel like we could talk to you on so many different topics. Like, why weren't you the prime minister of this country? (laughs) What? Well, that's actually a question I wanted to ask you about. Um, I spent a lot of my life being a pathologist. Yeah. The the question, I suppose, for me is, uh, and something I like to ask, Hamish can speak for himself as well, but um, is, you know, in public life, you know, you went to a point where, you were a Lord Mayor and then you had ran two terms for the seat of Adelaide. And then when you lost, you know, it was a tough defeat. And now you're coming back again into the public life again in a, in a you know, hopefully, when the, this election is finished. What was that like going as far as you did and then having to step away from politics? Like we generally don't have those conversations with politicians when you know, John Howard loses his seat or someone retires. Like we don't, we don't ever ask them what that feels like. You know, I'm probably not a good person to ask that because I don't think of myself as a politician. When I come into the country, you know, you fill out those forms and they say, what is your usual occupation? I always say I'm a pathologist. Mm. I regard myself as a pathologist. I don't regard myself as anything else because that's what I'm qualified to do. That's what my training is. That's what... I've learnt to do and trained to do most of my life. That is my usual occupation. So all of the other things are just public service and just Mm. volunteer. You know, some of it's volunteering. And so I don't regard being elected as the pinnacle of my life. That's just another experience. And so I'm slightly embarrassed at the idea that when I lost an election in 2010, it was a crisis and the end of something. It was just another experience. Yeah. And I went on to do other things. And I was fortunate that 
people have always people always ask me to do things. So I was asked by Julia Gillard actually to write a review on funding for universities. And then I was asked to be the acting director of the Royal Institution. And then I was the chair of the museum. Yep. And now I'm the chair of the Teachers Reg Board. So I get people find things for me to do. So I've never felt that there's been a hole in my life or a vacuum. I think I've been lucky. Yeah, you've been able to like jump from one opportunity to the next in a yes. sense just because you have this magnetic approach to life. Well, I've, I, I think it's peculiar that I've done, you know, I've been involved with m- medical things, education, research and government. But I do think when you say jump to, use, to take opportunities, the one thing I would advise people, I always say, um, is you sometimes only get a chance once. I can't tell you how many times decent, young, skilled people have said to me, oh, I've been given this chance or an opportunity, you know, I could go to London to do this or I could get a job in Canberra or I could take on a directorship somewhere and it's just not the right time. And I just want to grab them and shake them because it might be inconvenient for your children's school. It might be difficult for your spouse. It might be hard financially but i have to tell you you never get a chance twice you can't you can't say for instance i'm standing for election i'd like to be the lord mayor but not this time i'll do it next time yeah you have to do it grab every chance because you'll Uh, never get a second one i feel bad now because that was an opportunity i had was to stand in this council election you should have yeah but i decided that i didn't want my public profile on the (laughs) <laughs> on the bill, you know, I didn't want it been scrutinised just yet. Um, with considering how um, this election is somewhat toxic at times, you know, the last four or five years. Yes, well, I think that people have behaved pretty badly on the Adelaide City Council, and that's one of the motivations for me standing. Because if you love the city and you want it to do well, you realise that it, nothing can thrive with such a toxic environment, and. The thing that I feel really strongly about is it's not just us, we residents, it's not just the business people in the city. The whole state suffers if the Adelaide City Council underperforms because the Mm. council area might be like a local council, local government, but it's a capital city, it's so much more important. And for people across the metropolitan area, from Udnadatta to Port Augusta and down to Mount Gambia, Every one of those people looks towards Adelaide as the place that's caught their sort of cultural heart mm. of their state. And if the city underperforms, it impacts on everyone because this should be the economic powerhouse. It should be the cultural centre. It should be the institutional centre. And if it's a cot case, then the state suffers. Mm. So given that we have about 30% commercial vacancy in our city, how can we go about... Re- resurrecting the commercial sector? Well, I think that there are several issues that need to be thought about. I think we've got to be honest. I, I keep reading accounts of how Adelaide's booming, and I think, who believes that? Yeah. I walk down the street and there are empty coffee shops. There are rooms, there are, uh, there are places for lease. I go to restaurants and they close one day a week. And they don't open for breakfast because they can't fill their rosters. We have to be honest and admit that office vacancies um, may never get back to where they were before. And if people continue to work 15, 20% from home, then we won't need the number of offices or the floor area that we've got. I think there's another challenge is every time we invest, the state invests in a new you know, six, seven-star building, there's a sort of flight to quality, so everyone else loses occupancy. People move from lower-grade, older buildings up to the new ones, and you can get, I think they call it stranded assets, where there are properties that are never going to be filled because they're too low a standard. Mm. And it's going to cost a lot of money for the owners to refit them. Mm. The other issue is that if you understand that people are not going to go back to the offices, we need a different retail mix. We don't need as many coffee shops or cafes in the city. We need different retail 
and we need different ways of using our office space. Office space. So that lettable floor area either has to be repurposed into residential or we have to find ways of upgrading the lower grade office floor space because it needs to be repurposed. And I think that the property owners and the business owners in the city need to form an alliance with the council to, to audit what we've got, work out where the money has to be spent and see if there's a way that they can jointly fund refurbs, refits. Now, if I'm talking, I've, I know the state government talked about repositioning re commercial or office space into residential. They talked about upmarket luxury apartments. I think that's fine, but we also have a housing crisis. So I'm really keen to find ways of getting young people, working people, essential service workers, you know, hospital mm. type workers, young people, retail and hospitality workers into the city as well, because we need the vibrancy of young people. We don't just want really rich people in the city. You need to have young people there to do the jobs as much as anything else. Oh so yeah, I'd live. I'd live um, in a place in the city if the you know if the rent was a bit cheaper. You know, if, and like, and you completely like agree with what you say. Like, there's a lot of high class apartments, but there's not a lot of like that D C grade space being put into residential right. use. And know? the other issue is um, if you travel to Europe, the reason Europe doesn't feel so economically depressed in the big cities is that they have a lot of residents above the shops. Our shops are sitting underneath dark buildings. It would be so much better if we filled up those places with tenancies. I mean, I just... And people say, oh, you know, it's different, that difficult, there are planning laws, there are fire regulations, there are things... Yeah. Well, let's find a way of changing it. Let's find a way of changing the legislation and making it safe. Let's find a way of having financial inducements to make sure that everybody's filling up those buildings. Have you have you ever seen? Um, I've never seen so many t upstairs vacancies that are not just buildings not in use. Oh, you could be so living there. There's so much. Rundle Street does it pretty well. They've been able. Rundle to Street East does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Rundle Street East has been able to get people upstairs. But, like, you go and Rundle Mall and there's just nothing. Mm. There is literally nothing above ground. And there's another issue about young people or people on lower income. And it, it sounds really weird, but if someone's in a luxury apartment, they've got a lot of money, they don't spend all their money. Poorer people on lower income spend all their money. They spend it in yes. shops. So if they're living above the shops... They're down there spending money. Yeah. And that's what we need for the keep the retail vibrant. And that's what it would be good. I mean, it'd be great if you could live in the city. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to have an office there, so it'd be good to be able to, yeah. be able to walk to the office. Yeah. So that's, that's I think, the way to deal with the, the office vacancies. And how do you actually go about creating, for example, like a separate less onerous building code so then – landlords can actually go about repurposing that kind of space without it being too financially exorbitant? Well, I think we've talked about the council being dysfunctional and one of the things that really is important is to rebuild the relationships with government because at the moment it's a bit testy to say the least. Um, there is a review of the planning laws. It's going to uh, it's open for consultation closing in December. I'd like to think the council had done some preliminary work on this. I'd like to think they've actually thought about it. I'm not convinced. They spend a lot of time doing things other than core business. But in a normal organisation, if you knew there was a review, you'd have a, you know, a big document ready to go. But I think it's really important that we form, uh, we reform good relations with the planning minister. We say what the problem is. We get a round table, if you like, of property owners who know what the problems are because you can't you can't hatch a policy without speaking to the people who've got skin in the game. Yeah, you there's know. none of that, is there? No, well they've got there are people out there with skin in the game. You need them in the room. No, that's what I mean. There's there's none of that consultation yeah. going on. Yeah. That's any yeah. kind of the bubble. Formal So I'm a great believer and I did it in the old days with the um, tourism ministers round table. Rodney your father used to come to that. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm a great believer in getting the people who know what they're talking about into the room so they can speak to the, the um, 
people who are developing the policy and to actually saying what the problem is and what they need. And then the council can be the advocacy body that can actually speak to the government and say these are the changes we need. The council should be at the table pulling those people together and working for the benefit of their constituents. So what's been getting in the way of that actually happening? Like are people getting lazy? They just Just, like is it just laziness or is it they don't care? They're running their own selfish agendas for being more about what they want as opposed to facilitating what the community needs or like how what how does that kind of condition actually get created? I don't I'm I don't know enough about their ill will and their toxicity, but we know there's a problem. <laughs> Fair. And I think that we do know that when you're fighting amongst yourself it's very difficult to be strategic and think f- ahead. Um and it seems to me that the city has some serious problems, really serious problems. I mean, the office vacancy, the retail decline, the housing crisis, and the fourth big issue that I think is important for the city is a skills deficit. Mm. Because one of the issues about, you know, the fact that there are restaurants that can't fill rosters and they can't, haven't got enough staff is that there are people are not being trained to those, for those jobs. So I think if we could work collaboratively on office vacancies, retail issues, housing crisis and skills deficit. There are four big issues that we need to sort out to make the city buzz. And until we get on top of those, we're never going to get ahead. Makes a lot of sense. Hear, hear. <laughs> how awesome. Okay, so let's go back to your, the journey of like how you actually came to be the woman you are today, you're from England, yes? Yeah, I'm from England. I went to school in London, the east end of London. I went to a medical school in Whitechapel, which is called the Midwife Territory, poor area of London, um, and then trained as a pathologist. And I got offered a job in Adelaide, and that's why I'm here. Real. Yeah. So you lived, like, all your fundamental years in, in England? In London, there you go. And what kind of things do you, do you think that instilled in you that you've been able to use in your life, like, uniquely that are London about you? Well, I've never thought of myself as uniquely London. Um, clearly I came from an East End background, a relatively poor background, but I had a really good education. I went to a very good school. Um, how did how did that happen? Your they have parents a, just grinded or you got a scholarship? No, no, they have – no, they had a system in England where you sat an exam when you were 11 and if you passed the exam, a couple of percent of kids went to a grammar school. So I went to a That's grammar a, school. I don't mind that as a system. That can kind of be good for getting aptitude up. It was a really good school. So everybody went to university. There were two people who didn't go to university. One did physiotherapy and the other did a trilingual, I'll say that again, trilingual secretarial course. <laughs> Pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, but everyone went to university. It was a fabulous school. Set me up for life. It's a bit like Geelong Grammar or St. Peter's-esque. Is that kind of <laughs> public you? school. Okay. Oh, yeah. Really good public school. Right. Wow. And how does that happen? Like, how do they have schools like that? Is it is it similar to what you see in, like, Finland where – I mean, because, like, England has heaps of private schools as well. So how do you how do you foster um, such good public England school has education? less – private schools i think than australia because Aust- it australian governments give money to private schools whereas in england they don't get subsidized by the state so you have to be quite rich to go to a private school in england and um they have a secular system uh, where they don't have the same number of religious schools as we have here so but it was a really good school um but also i went to a very good preschool i went to a kindergarten which was quite you know advanced <laughs> i think but i think one's education actually sets you up for life and you know you've all had good edu- education so that's why you can do the things you do thank you i agree i've enjoyed my education not all parts of it but especially uni i got the chance to study abroad in new york that's amazing that was phenomenal so you went to bond yeah so i went to bond and then yes. studied at uh, Stony Brook on Long Island. It was awesome. I tell you what, Australian education's you? better than 
American education. How long were you there in America? <laughs> uh, six months. Yeah. It was a good time. Must have been exciting. Oh, I, I so had a similar exciting. thing as well. In year 11, I went to Arding Lane, West Sussex for school for a, for a term. So, that now, was that a cricket thing or that was a, a sports cricket thing. thing? Yeah, it was a cricket thing, but I, yeah. I played a lot of cricket, didn't, didn't do a lot of schooling <laughs> when I was there, to be honest. But it was interesting. You had to wear a suit um, to, to class and, and women had to wear like office wear. So it was another level of what I was used to in terms of um, presentation. presentation and yeah. Yeah. I played cricket at school. Um, the most extraordinary cricket thing that's ever happened to me was going to India with Buff Lehman. Wow. And yeah, that'd be interesting. I, at the time, it was a Who's marketing ploy. Darren Lehman. <laughs> I don't know. Is. He's is an it, icon. Yeah. Okay. He was, he was, he was, like he was a, cricket a icon. Yeah, big cricket player okay, and he was also cool. like a Australian uh, – he was a coach of the Australian team. He played for Yorkshire. Okay. Please um, continue. So anyway – I was sent to India to market Adelaide as an international student destination. Wow. And they sent me with Buff Lehman. And we travelled around to four or five cities. And I didn't really have to do very much. He did the star performance. And wherever we went, we were mobbed, absolutely mobbed. Um, People came up to us in the street and wanted photographs with him. And he was an extraordinary ambassador for not just cricket, but Australia and Adelaide. He was so impressive. He was so generous. He signed every piece of paper, every cigarette box, every newspaper, anything anyone gave him, he signed. He stopped continually for photographs. He remembered everyone's name. Every doorman at every hotel, he remembered their names. He was the most generous um, superstar mm. one could ever imagine. Got a lot of time for Buff Lehman. Very genuine. I had a good experience because I went to um, Greg Blewett's cricket camp in year seven and uh, Darren Lehman was um, a guest for the day. And um, yeah, I just went up to him and asked him for a photo and he was really, and he was busy. He was running around and he was completely happy to do it. So just Charming. Like, bowled me a bowl in the nets as well. So yeah, as a, as a seven-year-old when you're a cricket fan, that's a pretty massive thing. That is a pretty amazing yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, hey, I didn't get out. <laughs> you know, yeah. I had the opposite experience with my little sports star when I was growing up. I was at Next Gen, and I go up to um, Leighton uh, Hewitt. Hewitt with my brother, and we're like, "Oh, Leighton, Leighton, Leighton!" They were playing. He was playing squash with one of the footy players, and we're like, "Leighton, Leighton, Leighton, can we get an autograph?" And he just turns around, and goes, "F off." <laughs> and it was like what and then it was like i remember it famously i was like crying to my mom about it and i was like he was like in on the paper with this little kid being like oh you know being all friendly with the kid i was like he's not like that yeah. <laughs> that's like a 10 year old i don't know what he's like now but but i think it teaches you about generosity because you know if you're fortunate enough to be elected or you're a star and people pay to see you you actually have a an obligation to the public. You can't be too ratty. Mm. Um, and you do have to be respectful because people trust you and admire you. I do, that's why I, you know, I've got a lot of admiration for Buff. Mm. What changed this year? Because this campaign is, you were a late entrance to the council campaign. What, what was something that triggered you to go, I need to stand up and, and go for this again? Well, I'll be honest. People have been saying for a year or so, Someone needs to sort that lot out. And I thought, well, you know, I've got other things to do. But I think the final straw for me was when they couldn't close a road for three days. Oh, yeah, yeah. That just tipped me over the edge. They would they had closed the road for three months for a light show. And then having negotiated with the tourism portfolio and agreed to close it for three days for an event, a music event, they reneged and reversed it. And the thing I feel really strongly about is that if you actually have an arrangement, you do a deal, you agree to do something, you've negotiated on it, you shake hands, you sign off, you do it. I think that the council has to be seen as an organisation that you might not always agree with. They might disagree with the state government. They might have debates and arguments. But you have to be able to trust them to stick to their word. And mm. if you can't trust them, how can we go carry on? Anyway, that, that tipped me over the edge. 
there's definitely there's some real troublemakers on the council, and there's some there's some gems. There's some there's some good people in there as well. And I sometimes talk to some of the good people, and and they just tell me some of the pettiness that goes on. For instance, um, I saw back in, when you were Lord Mayor that you were aware of that when you had the uh, the dinner situation that you know council people would eat dinner all together after the after meetings. And it's kind of been a discussion now about whether that should be cut and whether it should be saved for money and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's just such petty business to be concerned about if you're running a capital city. Well, I think the budget of 210 million or whatever it is, the cost of a dinner is just a rounding error. But the other problem is they have meetings that go till two in the morning. Mm. And I don't think you should ever be making decisions at two in the morning that affect a big organisation. I mean, that's really crazy. <laughs> and if, if, if these people have had a day at work, they go to the council at 5.30, they're expected to be there till two in the morning without a meal. The staff are expected to be there till two in the morning without a meal. It's mad. I mean, I'll be gnawing at the furniture. No. I, I just don't know how you can be expected to be functional. So that's one problem. Um, but the other issue that I find really peculiar is um, there will always be arguments on council. When I, I was on the council and we heritage listed 1,300 buildings, and I'll be frank, there were a number of councillors who hated that policy. We argued endlessly. They would be happy to have demolished everything, build new buildings, you know, have no heritage, build on the parklands. There were fights all the time. But I used to look across the chamber and the other councillors used to, if I said something witty, they'd wink at me and we'd go in the middle of the meeting, we'd stop for half an hour and have mid-dinner together, we'd have a glass of wine, we'd laugh. We were still friends. And now I'm standing as Lord Mayor, those very people who were on the other side of all the debates, who argued constantly, they've been phoning me and saying, thank goodness you're standing, we're really pleased, we're glad to vote for you. We've stayed in contact. Some of them live interstate, they phoned me. Um, I mean, I just think, why are the people so vicious and unpleasant? Why can't they cooperate? Because there's so much that people can agree, you know, people can agree on the rubbish collection and the weeding of the parklands. Why do you have to fight over everything? It mystifies me. Jane, honestly, I think that's a that's a great question for the whole cultural zeitgeist of the West <laughs> right now. Yeah. Like, why can't we just have civil discussions and civil disagreements and civil debates? Well, Where, I've, yeah, where's it I've, gone? I've actually become a bit obsessed with understanding the people who I disagree with. So I'm obviously on the left of politics, and I, I hate the Australian. I mean, it drives me mad. They say dopey things. Um, I get really cross in England when I read The Telegraph, and I get quite cross when I read The Spectator. But I keep reading them because I think it's really important that you understand where people are coming from and you can actually come to grips with what they've thought. And it softens your view to them when you, view of them when you understand how they got that idea. For instance, it's very easy for me to be scathing about anti-vaxxers I mean, I'm a doctor, I'm a pathologist. I could really get angry about people who are anti-vaxxers. And I know people who are anti-vaxxers. And I still talk to them. And I remember reading something about a hairdresser in Byron Bay who had a sign-up that said, anybody who's had a vaccination is not allowed to enter the hairdressers in case they're shedding (laughs) virus. And it's easy to say they're mad, you know, just ignore them. But the reality is there's always a kernel of truth because in the old days, some vaccines were live vaccines. So when you had a polio vaccine, you actually had live vaccine that had been heated up a bit so it didn't kill you. So it was attenuated live vaccine. And when you got it, they actually, it bred inside you and then you passed it out in your feces and urine. So you were shedding virus. So the kernel of truth is in those old-fashioned vaccines, you shed virus. Of course, don't do it now with mRNA. You can't shed virus because there's nothing live. But actually understanding where they got it from helps you to actually talk to them and say, you know, look, I understand why you think that, but it can't work. 
I think it's actually a part of civil society to really get to grips and be able to understand what people think. I mean, I, there must be people that believe things that you think are wrong. Oh, for sure. Flat earthers. Yeah, but oh. <laughs> I, that's actually quite difficult. Um, but, no shedding there. <laughs> but it is, it is kind of interesting to try and work out why people think things. Yeah. yeah. All right, question. Okay, since you are like literally an expert, in terms of COVID, something came out the other day from the state of Florida from their like medical people. And what they said from their findings was that males between 18 and 39 f- after receiving mRNA vaccines had an 84% increase in uh, cardiac, de- like in the likelihood of being dying from cardiac related death. I think you've got to think of what percentages mean. If you have, let's just make up a number. People in that age range are incredibly unlikely to have anything wrong with their heart. Yeah. So let's just pretend that the number is you have a one in a million chance of dying. Mm. One in a million. If you increase that by 84%, it's 1.84 in a million. Yeah. That actually, you know, if you were betting on horses, it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah, but in the context of where that state has put their opinion is they're no longer recommending it as like a, a, a because they don't see that the, the benefit out, you know, the benefits don't outweigh the, the risks for the mRNA vaccine. Well, it, de- it definitely doesn't because you know, Pfizer and stuff just came out and just said that we never tested for community spread. That we never designed these vaccines to stop one one person giving it to the next person, which is a complete just conspiracy because that's what we were told by governments the whole time was get vaccinated for other people. It wasn't about protecting yourself until much later. And then we've now we're coming out with a lot of these uh, medical journals and stuff that were suppressed for a year and a half, you know, because of government. Um, well, they were supposed to be suppressed for 70 years, but then there was some Freedom of Information Act that made – the companies, dis, uh, what does it exclude? Disclose their data. Yeah, I think the um, the challenge with big pharma is always the way their evidence is framed and published. And big pharma has had a long tradition, putting aside COVID, of funding research, which they don't allow to be published if it doesn't say what they want. Yeah, and they've they've. It's nothing to do with COVID. This is just pharmacological comp- pharmacology companies. They always do it. That's because they're profit driven, right? Yeah, that's and that's the problem because they had all the power in this, this situation, and then they've used it to manipulate to their own ends on and on a scale that's not been seen since World War Two, probably. But in in fairness, with the evidence that was there at the beginning, the the idea of making a vaccine was a good one, and the vaccine, I'm still pleased I've had it. I'm sure you both have it, haven't haven't you? Have you had the vaccine? And I'm going to say out of principle, I don't want to disclose because it's something that's become too common that everybody expects everybody to be able to say like, oh, I've had this medical procedure, this medical treatment across the board. Well, you have the right not to tell anyone. Yeah, but that's the thing. In terms of the social, it's become something that everybody's ostracizing each other around the world. And I don't think that's okay. No, I mean, I've just come back from England and I've been quite shocked. I've had really good friends who voted for Brexit. And that's mad. I mean, you know, the idea of giving up the right to free travel, the right to free education. It was an emotion. That's an emotional vote, yeah. You, um, can, you can see why people wanted to do it, but once you actually logically step through it, you're like, oh, well, now I can't go to France. Like, can't, you know. <laughs> Can't go to Italy. In but the same what way. is really strange is that families have broken up over it. Yeah, yeah. I went true. to someone's house and they weren't talking to their sister. That's madness. They, it's mad. That's madness, and that's where this theme of polarized discussion has gone so far. Like we can't civilly disagree as like a broad brushstroke of society. Like, why do you think that is? Why do you think? I think we've gotten scared of the actual freedom of freedom of speech and being able to disagree. Like, why do you... 
Why do you think that is? But you're of the generation that uses the kind of, um, f- let's say, the Facebook pylon. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's more common for young people to attack. You know, you've got to be politically correct in many ways. Oh so yeah, we're the, we're the worst, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, we're not. We're we're pretty good, but <laughs> you know, not but that like, bad. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of like that, like I I, I got vaccinated. I got Novavax in the end because I wasn't sold on NDRA vaccines. Um, but at the end of the day, I would have been happy with not being vaccinated because I, I back my ability to main, to manage my health and look after my health in, in different ways. Yeah. It doesn't mean I haven't had a flu vax, but I think that's the one of the big issues with how I we I love with vaccinations. It. In general, I do. I love, in general, you I know, I've had everything. I've so old, I've had smallpox vaccinations. I've had polio diphtheria, everything. I've had lots of tropical diseases, stuff, vaccinations, and I think vaccinations are wonderful. How much time do you guys have left? Um, I haven't got my watch on. What's the time? What's the time? 7.30. Oh, it must be getting on. Is it, well, another 10 minutes? Sure. Yeah, too easy. We run your schedule. But we believe in um, something Hamish and I both got done regu- uh, recently was IV drip. Was in an interview his drip like um, from this place called the Drip Club and to know, do what vitamins vitamins they pack it full of vitamins Why and then bother? you get energetic and I don't know just boost your immune system. I think that if you eat proper food, you don't need extra vitamins. True, I'm, but I'm old true. school. But you'd be surprised if you are tracking your minerals and vitamins in your normal diet in normal diet, how lacking you are in some areas. Like if you have fish, you don't have red meat, you will not have iron. And that is a huge issue for a lot of women. So what was the um, safety of the procedure and who was doing it? Uh, IV. Uh, it was, well, it's organised by, um, you, you see, like you scream with a doctor and then you have the drip club who's professionals in that area as well. So it's, there's, it's like very much like you sign a lot of Yeah, wave, they go through the stuff. procedures they need to go through. Yeah. But... Instead of us getting onto drips, can I just say, I, yeah. as a as someone who's put up a lot of drips, you <laughs> don't want to damage your veins. Well, that's fair. You don't uh, because too much. you can bugger your veins and make them fibrotic and scarred, and then one day you might need them. So my view is, you don't put anything in your veins unless you really need it. All right, advice. Sound. Good point. Sorry. Education. <laughs> Since it's a big thing that you've spent a lot of your life doing, how do you think we can? Uh, foster the best education system imaginable in Australia, make the best humans? What do you think needs to happen? I think you need the best teachers. Yeah. Um, And and how do you create the condition for better teachers across the board? I think you respect them and don't bag them all the time. I think it's really tough for people to go into teacher training when everywhere people are moaning about schools and teachers. And, you know, you get one bad apple, one person who's done something wrong mm. and the media pump it up so it sounds as if it, all teachers are doing something yeah. wrong yep. you have to recognize that it's probably the most important job in our community facts do you think we need to like pay them more and treat them more like professionals and have higher atars and such absolutely like that the best um i think that in europe they have much higher entry requirements but they treat them with respect yeah well they treat them like professionals yeah. right whereas here they're more like they're more like childhood carers yeah they're just like well i service. think that's the way it was during covid yeah. people wanted kids to go to school so they didn't have to get looked after so it was very difficult yeah fair. <laughs> have you seen what they've done in like finland <laughs> how they've like gotten rid of uh private schools and then they've made it so everybody has to go to public school so then all the people that like are affluent that would usually lobby their schools to make them better and whatnot are now doing that with all the public schools. That's a good idea because I think that you shouldn't residualise the public system by leaving people who are less able to complain in them. And actually there's another issue. It's not just the quality because the parents are more articulate and complain more. It actually enriches the child's experience to mix with other people. I think it's really a good skill for children to learn to be able to talk to people from different backgrounds. And it actually makes you more tolerant. I think it's... I actually don't 
entirely approve of single religion schools mm. because it makes people think that other people are different and can't, they can't be friends across religious divides. I think it's much better if everyone's mixed up. Sport's a good equaliser for that. It is indeed. I'm yeah. actually the patron of the Turf Umpires and Scorers Association. They're right. That's uh, pretty interesting. So random. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of random yeah, things. Is that, random thing. is that the That's Afghani uh, cricket stuff? No, it's all the umpires and scorers, but they have a few um, Afghani and Indian teams. Because they're not going to be happy about the Aquatic Centre moving onto their oval for a bit, are they? No. <laughs> yeah, they're going to um, lose that one for a little while. But it's really yeah. – in- I, I think being a, an umpire is such an amazingly tough job. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that if you give up playing cricket, you should give it a go. They need tough – Fair people to train as umpires. I like that. Tough you thing. love enforcing rules, don't oh, you? You, know. you play beer pong with this yeah. guy, and he is just oh. a Nazi of rules. Oh, I Lord. think you need to take it up. <laughs> hey, look, if it's uh, something I could do, stand around for three or four hours and get paid twenty four five dollars an hour, it's pretty good. You know? Yeah, you and go. then eventually you can get up to the oval. You start off with the umpires and scorers, and then you move into soccer. I was always good at cricket rules. I was always very, and I, I knew all the. You know, I'm different sure variations. You did. I'm sure you yeah, did. Yeah, I'm good at those kind of things. All right, before we so go. So I'm good at giving you advice, aren't I? Telling people what to do. You you've are. Got to <laughs> you've made a career out of it. You've made a career. So I, I, I want to ask this because I think it's something that's being contested right now in the West, which is a fundamental pillar of like, uh, like freedoms in a sense, even though it's not actually in our legislation, is freedom of speech. Obviously, we don't have it in a constitution, but where does that line sit for you in what is uh, acceptable free speech and what is non-acceptable free speech? I don't think you should do anything that encourages violence Mm -hmm. or abuse. Um, But I do think that we do need to be able to have a discussion and some things shouldn't be off limits. I think it's really... um, I'm shocked that some universities... Move, have moved so far to have trigger warnings and limit what lecturers can say. I think that it's... I'm even shocked that some books are being banned. There are parts of America where they've banned To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. Yeah, a classic. And you just Dr. think... Dr. Zeus was banned the other day, one of Dr. Zeus's books. It's bizarre. Um, but book burning and book banning is a really bad thing. Um, have you read 1984? Yep. It feels quite Orwellian. It does indeed. What? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> nice pun. Oh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> um, and do you think that we will turn the tide? Yes, everything's always pendulum swinging back and forward. You live long enough, things change. Yeah. Have, have you found that in your lifetime that it's been an issue? Is like this level, like, conversation of political correctness or do you think it's more of like it happened a few hundred years ago in some places i think what's really interesting is that a while ago nobody admitted they were gay it was shameful it was embarrassing it was illegal Hmm. no one would have considered same-sex marriage but now no one takes any notice of it Hmm. some things just become not an issue with time yeah. There you go. Anything you'd like to say before we sign off? No, all I'm thinking of is probably dinner time. Fair enough. Same. Yeah. We're going to have to do this again. It's when been lovely to talk to you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for your time, your attention, your wisdom, your lessons, your candidness. I really appreciate you and thank you for coming on the voyage. It's been great to talk to you both. Thank all, you so much. All Jane. three. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. You're welcome.